Hello, shall we get started? Are we ready for this? Okay, let's do it. Um, welcome to welcome to Kansas. Um, I have always been very excited about this RailsConf because I always wanted to come to Kansas. Um, I um, I've always heard about this movie called Wizard of Oz, and um, it's as you can tell, it's a little bit ahead of my time. But I watched it before. I come here in preparation for a conference, um, but as we learned in Jeremy's keynote the other day, um, it turns out these lines on the maps are state lines and Kansas is on the left, and the other half is Missouri and it turns out Kansas City is um, actually not in Kansas. So um, I guess we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I have to redo all my slides to add colors to them, so if uh, they don't look very good, that's probably why. Um, I am um, Godfrey. You can find me on the internet as Champion Goat, and I'm very excited to welcome you to your employee, uh, new employee orientation. I hope you're at the right place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're looking for RailsCon, I'm afraid they've moved. So, no, just kidding. This is RailsCon. Uh, welcome to RailsCon, and thank you for coming. Um, I, I always say um, there's a very personal thing about RailsConf to me, and I love coming back. This is actually my fifth RailsConf. Um, five years ago in um, Austin, that was my first RailsConf, and actually I attended there, um, attended RailsConf Austin as um, um, with on the students student scholarship. So if you were there, um, thank you for uh, chipping in for my ticket. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this community. And next year, I went back to um, RailsConf Portland. And for some reason, I had suddenly the courage to go back there and say, hey, I have a pull request. Can you merge it? And uh, for some reason, um, you end up merging it. So I have my first commit in Rails. And the next year, soon after the next uh, RailsConf in Chicago, um, I joined the Rails core team, and the year after, I spoke at RailsConf for the first time, which was last year, and um, this year, I'm very honored to be part of the program community, uh, program community, program committee on um, RailsConf, and um, help create it the, um, behind the magic and new in Rails 5 tracks, so if you uh, went to those talks and um, like those tracks, um, well, that's where they come from, um, and, um, like Jeremy said the other day, uh, Rails is Rails exists because um, of its community. So um, thank you for being part of this community. So following Aaron's lead, I would like to announce some um, new Rails 5 features. Um, as you learned today, Rails 5 will come with PHP support. And um, following his lead, I would like to announce JavaScript support for Rails 5. And um, in fact, you don't even have to wait for Rails 5. You can just get it today by running gem install JavaScript. Um, once you have installed gem, all you need to do is require JavaScript on the top of your Ruby file. And um, there we go. You can just wrap anything in the JavaScript block and write your JavaScript code in there. Um, even supports things like functions. And that's very handy, because what is everyone's favorite JavaScript feature? Of course, that's callbacks. And what's everyone's favorite Rails features? Um, of course, that's also callbacks. So um, the JavaScript gem let you combine the best of both worlds. Like here's the active record model. You can have your favorite before create callback, and you can write that in JavaScript. So um, actually, um, just like the Fubi gem, this is a real thing you can use. And an insane amount of engineering went into that gem. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, I suggest you watch my talk at Garuko um, called Dropping Down to the Meadow. Um, you can find that on YouTube. Um, I have another thing to plug. Um, if you went to the lightning talk from yesterday, you would already know this, but um, I help coordinate a newsletter called This Week in Rails, where you find um, the latest um, commits and pull requests and things like that that went to Rails that's, that week. Um, and here is a sample from last week, and 
It includes sensational headlines like, Look, local scientists discover new method to manipulate time, faster code found to perform better under load, JRuby builds too flaky to be useful, and regex experts debate left to right or right to left is one better than the other. Um, if you haven't already, go to bit.ly slash Rails Weekly to subscribe to this newsletter. The next issue will be coming out in a few hours, and you will um, you will probably learn something new from there. Um, speaking of newsletter, I also, I'm also part of a newsletter, which is a product newsletter. So if you are not already signed up to Skylight, you should um, sign up at skylight.io and select the almost daily insider channel um, email preference. And uh, we'll usually write about our um, experience writing, uh, building Skylight, and a lot of times we'll um, read about things like, oh, I had this problem today, and we don't know how to deal with it. And some of our customers will say, hey, I had that problem last week, and here is a gem I found that does that. Or sometimes the opposite would happen. We'll be like, ah, we solved this problem today. And our customers would write back and say, ah, that's really great. I have the same problem at work. So um, if you're interested, you should go sign up. And if you have pen and paper, you might want to write down that secret URL. That's actually my personal um, referral URL, and I heard we have plans to um, distribute bonuses this year based on referral credits in our account, so please help me out. Anyway, um, let's talk about Ruby. So Ruby is great. We all love Ruby. That's why we're here. Um, Ruby has a lot of nice features. It reads really nice. Um, meta programming is pretty awesome. Um, but there's also a problem to Ruby, which is that it's pretty slow. Most of the time, it doesn't really matter, but occasionally, um, you might hit a wall when you try to do something in Ruby and it's just um, too slow for use case. On the other end of the spectrum, or perhaps on the other extreme of the spectrum, there's C, which is super low level, um, which is super fast, basically. It's like as close to metal as you can get without writing assembly, and um, that's great, but it's also um, pretty dangerous. You can very easily write code that crash your program at runtime um, in an unexpected way, and um, uh, there are also a lot of concepts that are a little bit hard to grasp. Um, so in Ruby, we have this feature called native extensions that give you the best of both worlds. So for example, when you run gem install.json, what you're getting is actually two different things for the price of one. So um, by default, you would get um, a thing called JSON Pure, which is a pure Ruby implementation of the JSON encoder. But if you're on a supported platform, you will also get another thing called JSON colon colon ext, which is native extension. Um, so it's the same um, JSON encoder API written in C, and so that's like super fast. But to you as a user, you don't even notice the difference because you just call it like a regular Ruby class and you call its method normally, and um, under the hood, it basically is um, transparently called the, call the C methods that does the work for you. And um, as a user, you don't have to care about that. And chances are you're already using native version without knowing it. Um, so native extensions, they are great. Why don't we write more of them? Well, there is a catch. So it's indeed the best of both worlds but it's only the best of both worlds if you're the end user that's using the gem. Um, this, is, this is fine. Um, David, who created Rails, um, have said something like this to me. Um, here's the general value of Rails development. We will jump through whatever hoops on the implementation side to make the user-facing API nicer. And I think I would personally extrapolate that um, user-facing API to um, developer experience in general. And I think that's a good goal to have. Like it's good to um, make the experience for your developer users as nice as possible um, while keeping, um, so keeping a beautiful interface on the outside and do whatever you need on the inside to make that work. So that's a great goal to have. And um, here is a good example of that. So, Sam Saffron, who um, you might have heard of, he did a lot of Ruby performance work and was a Ruby hero from last year. Um, so he noticed something in Rails. So it turns out in Rails, in active support in particular, there's a method called 
string dot blank. So um, it turns out this method is caught a lot both inside of um, the Rails framework and also in um, user code. So this is also the implementation of the flip side called present. So you might have seen things like um, user or params colon user dot present, right? So this is actually the method it's talking about. Um, this is the implementation in active support as of a few weeks ago. There are some improvements since then. We'll talk about that later. Um, so it's pretty short method, right? Like you basically reopen the string class and it basically check if the string is um, all white space characters. And that's all there is to it. This one liner, it reads beautifully like all of your Ruby code and that's great. And apparently, like, evidently this is a very useful method because um, we use it in our, in our application in Rails to make it a performance hotspot according to Sam. So what he did is he made a gem called FastBlank that we implemented the same blank method in C. And according to Sam, this C implementation is up to 20 times faster than the Ruby version we saw on the other side slide. And he said in some applications you can, you can get up to 5% um, performance improvement on the macro. Uh, now, as I said, there are some recent improvement to the Rails version, but for the purpose of this presentation, this particular number doesn't really affect that much because the optimization we did in Rails is about the um, in edge case or, or common case that is um, when the string is empty. So now if uh, we can, so as the user, you don't really need to know the difference, right? You just get the fast black blank jam in your app and all of your code works seamlessly because it provides the same um, string dot blank question mark method with um, just with a different implementation under the hood. Um, so you can get the performance you want um, and the user, the developer experience you want, um, then that seems great. Um, we're done here, right? Well, there is a problem though. The problem is me. Me being the developer that knows just enough C to be dangerous. If you give me a C program with a variable called PTR, um, I, if the code doesn't work, I'll, the first thing I try is probably add a star to it, and if it still doesn't work, maybe try more stars. <laughs> if more stars still doesn't fix it, maybe try ampersand. Um, and the problem with this is, as I mentioned before, uh, if you if you're like me, if you write your C code like this, your program can segfault at runtime, um, and that's pretty bad because you're, if you're embedding your C code inside a Ruby process, it will crash the entire Ruby process. This is not like a regular exception that you can you can handle. So at Scala, we we have a similar problem. Oh, by the way, this is I don't know if I mentioned it, but this is where I work. Um, we have um, we are performance analyzer uh, for Rails apps, and to do that, we have to have a agent that we put inside your app to collect performance data on production. And we uh, we want to make sure that our agent is as lightweight as possible. We don't want the thing that's supposed to be measuring your performance to become the bottleneck itself. Um, so we could write that agent in C or C++, and Fortunately, most of the engineers are smarter than me, and they don't randomly add stars and ampersands to variables in C. But even then, um, we don't feel very confident that we can get away with writing, main, writing and maintaining our um, own C code that goes inside of all of our customers' apps. Um, there are a lot of uh, native extensions in um, the Ruby community like Nokogiri or JSON Gem, um, in their early days, they all had various issues um, of sec folding at runtime, and those people were way smarter than me, and if even after very careful uh, writing, they still occasionally crashes, then we definitely won't want to recommend our customers put something like this in their app. So what is the alternative? Well, at the time when we started this project, um, Rust, um, just announced that they would, um, they have made some 
very good, um, very good improvements at the time, so we thought, hmm, we will um, perhaps give that a try. So what makes Rust different than writing your um, native extension in C or C++? Well, let's look at the Rust website. Um, Rust is a system programming language that runs blazingly fast, uh, prevents sackbots, and guarantees threat safety. Well, that's a lot of words that doesn't mean a lot to me yet. Um, but they have another slogan that tries to put the same thing in um, different words, which is hack without fear. Um, the goal of the Rust project is allow you to, um, to basically make system programming more accessible to um, more programmers, um, and it does that by having a, a compiler that knows about a lot of these things. So um, what makes Rust special is that as a compiler that can find most of these, um, well, actually all of these errors could, that could cause your program to crash at runtime and flag them at compile time. And if you don't do everything correctly and if you don't satisfy, um, if you don't, if you cannot convince the Rust compiler that your program is sound, it simply won't, uh, it, it will simply refuse to compile your program and um, therefore you don't have a thing to run at runtime and so it cannot crash at runtime. Um, so there are some features in Rust that makes that possible. Um, I can't get into a lot of details um, of Rust today and this talk is not really about teaching you Rust um, but I'll try to describe them at a very high level so um, you can perhaps try to understand them without seeing the actual code. Um, the first feature of Rust that makes this possible is um, they take care of managing the safety of your memory without using garbage collector. So Ruby is also um, a language that offers memory safety guarantee. In Ruby, you cannot write, um, you cannot write code that um, access random um, locations of memory and cost, causes your program to crash at runtime that way. So it's maybe, it perhaps sounds a little bit um, crazy to say that, oh, like your program cannot crash at runtime if you write in Rust, but in fact, you're already used to that because your Ruby program also cannot crash at runtime. Um, the difference is that Ruby um, manages that by using a garbage collector and Rust does that without a garbage collector. And what Rust does is basically tracks the lifetime of all your variables at compile time, so it knows exactly when, it need, when and where it needs to locate things and when um, it needs to clean it up. So it doesn't need to pause the program and um, clean up with a garbage collector periodically. Um, it also allows you to do um, concurrency without um, data raises or race conditions. Um, which I don't have time to get into right now. And the final feature that is particularly relevant for us, it, it has this concept of zero cost abstraction. So in Ruby or in, frankly, many, most other languages, um, you always have to make a trade off between um, abstracting your code versus performance. So like maybe you notice that you are doing, you're repeating a bunch of um, steps in a few places and you would want to extract that into a method in Ruby. So that's fine and that's what you should do most of the time. But unfortunately, um, this incurs the cost of an extra method invocation and when, when you're talking about really performance sensitive code, you have to make the trade off between how much you want to abstract your code between um, and how performant you want your code to be, right? So in Rails, for example, we have a lot of um, modules and we call super a lot, and that's how we decide we want to um, abstract our code ideally, but occasionally there might be cases where we realize uh, this is like really hot path and we really would prefer not to incur that cost and we have to inline some of the things, right? So in Rust, um, this, is one of the biggest feature in Rust where um, you can actually, you don't actually have to make the trade off between abstractions and performance because the Rust compiler is smart enough to notice that, ah, this method can be inlined into that other thing, so I'll just do that. Or in fact, a lot of time if you use higher level constructs in Rust like iterators, uh, it's actually giving the compiler more information about how you should, how the compiler can optimize your code um, 
so it actually makes your program run, run faster. So for example, in Ruby, um, you might want to write things in each loop, and we often do, and that's fine, but that's incurring the extra cost of making, um, calling the each method and stuff. On the other hand, on Rust, if you use an iterator, it actually makes it faster than writing a hand-rolled loop because the compiler knows um, ah, I'm, this is gonna be a safe iteration so it can remove some of the bound checks inside the, um, for each iteration. So I can't get into a whole lot more details, but Yehuda gave um, a talk on Rust at RailsConf here last year. So if you are new to Rust and you're curious about um, why you might want to look into this language, you can look up his talk from last year. So let's get back to FastPlank. Um, and I guess we'll look at the FastPlank Im implementation and see quickly. So this is the FastPlank body, so you probably cannot read it, but it's fine, we'll walk through it step by step together. So basically, um, at the top, you basically have uh, the method signature and some boilerplate to extract some pointers, and um, ah, so you have, uh, you then, uh, have a line that quickly check, oh, if the string is empty, then return right away so you, don't, you can avoid doing a bunch of extra work. And then the main part of the, the method is basically you loop through all the characters inside the string, and um, there's some more boilerplates about pointers. And finally, you have a switch statement. Um, if you encounter a white space character, you keep looping, basically, and if you encounter a non-white space character, you know that this string is not blank, so we can return false immediately. Um, otherwise, if you get to the end of the loop, you know that all of, your, um, all of the characters you have encountered um, in the string are all white space characters, so we can return true. So this probably looks a little bit more scary than it actually is, perhaps only because it's on a slide, but this is like 50 line of code, right? And it's not particularly, um, particularly difficult to reason about. So if we can get up to 20 times faster performance, writing 50 lines of C code seems worth it. Um, so next, let's look at the equivalent fast blank implement implementation in Rust. And here it is. So this is uh, literally a one-liner function in Rust that does exactly the same thing and handles all the Unicode edge cases correctly. Um, let's walk through it. So basically define an um, extern C function. This basically tells Rust, please, um, I know that this code is gonna be called from a C program, so please keep the, um, use the C function calling convention for when you actually compile my program. Um, that part is not particularly important except um, to illustrate the point that Rust is um, a pretty low level system programming language that's designed to interrupt with um, other C programs and the Ruby implementation that you're probably using the MRI um, or C Ruby implementation is a C program so they work pretty nicely together. And because, uh, like I said, the Rust compiler cares a lot about safety so you have to do a little bit of work to um, annotate your code to the compiler and give it in enough information to know that your code is doing um, correct things. So here we're telling uh, the compiler what the type of the input to this function will be. Um, the specific type we use here is not particularly important except to point out that you need to tell the compiler which type each variable is gonna be. Um, it also helps Rust to, the Rust compiler to figure out how to um, allocate memory for, for all of these things because um, as, much, as much as possible, Rust try to allocate things on the stack so it doesn't have to, um, which makes cleaning up a lot faster, which is um, another key to um, Rust performance. So here we're annotating to the um, we're telling the compiler that this method is gonna return a Boolean value because um, the blank question mark method is expected to return either true or false um, depending on whether the string is blank or not. And the actual body of the method is perhaps gonna remind you about um, the Ruby code that you're used to writing. So here we are um, getting all the characters from um, the string as an iterator, and we're using 
in these high levels combinators like dot all, you're probably familiar with this in Ruby, it's equivalent to the array dot all question mark method that loops through the array and check if each of those um, items in the array matches um, a certain condition. And you have things like block, which is also a thing we like to use in Ruby. And finally, you are, for each character in the, in the buffer, you're checking whether it is a white space character or not. And this is white space is a method provided by the Rust stand library that knows how to um, do the big switch statement we have in the C implementation. So this is pretty terse and perhaps surprisingly so because we're now programming a system, um, system programming language and surprisingly it looks kind of similar to what you would write in Ruby, right? So is this gonna be um, sacrificing a lot of performance compared to the C version because it's so terse and so high level? Well, we ran some benchmarks and if you look closely, um, this is iterations per um, second, by the way, so the higher the number, the better. So at the bottom, you have the pure Ruby implementation, and on top, we have Rust, and next to it is the C implementation. If you look closely, the Rust version is actually a little bit faster than the C version, um, even though we're using high-level things like iterators and um, dot all. So, of course, I'm not being very scientific here. I'm not trying to convince you that Rust is faster than C. I'm just trying to convince you that you can get away with writing the high-level code that you're used to um, without sacrificing performance. At least you'll get code that is in the same ballpark as the C equivalent. So um, let's look at this code again. Um, ah, turns out there's a catch I didn't tell you about. Um, the catch is there is a lot of glue code that I didn't show you here. Um, if you look at the full Rust versus C um, extension, you notice that on the left, the red part is the one-liner I showed you, and on the right, that's the very big C function body that I showed you, and indeed, the C function body is much larger than the one-liner on the left. However, if you count all the boilerplate code around it, um, they're roughly the same size uh, in terms of line of codes. Um, not all is lost, though. Um, I should point out that on the Rust side, a lot of those are um, common shared abstractions like the buffer implementation and things like that that could be extracted out, whereas on the C side, that's literally your business logic, so you have to write that amount of code every time you want to write a C extension like this, whereas on the left, um, that's actually the only, the, the one-liner is um, the only thing that's specific to your extension. Still, this is not very nice. So um, Yehuda and I have been working on this project um, called Helix, um, and our goal is to make mo most of those boilerplate go away and take advantage of um, Rust features like zero cost abstraction to make it, um, to help you focus on writing the thing you want to write without having to roll all the boilerplate all the time. So here is the entire um, fast blank extension written in Helix. So we are using a Rust macro feature which lets you write things that's pretty similar to Ruby DSLs. And um, so here we are, um, at the top we're importing our library and here we're declaring a bunch of Ruby types. And the first thing we do is we try to reopen the Ruby string class and we add a method called is blank and you might find this syntax somewhat familiar. And um, finally, in the, in the code, we have the one-liner that we saw earlier, and this is all the code you need to write to write an extension like FastBlank fast and Rust and Helix. So um, my personal um, goal for this um, going forward is um, I would like to be able to experiment implementing some of um, Rails features in terms of um, in, in Helix. So we already have an extensive test suite in, um, in Rails, and there are a lot of um, modular parts that that is like string.blank that can be swapped out into a, into a Rust extension without affecting any of the user-facing API. So um, we can continue to iterate quickly on the Ruby implementation um, 
on the sorry on the pure Ruby implementation on the Rails side while taking advantage of the um, existing Rails test suite and um, write these experiment with these lower level implementation and um, as long as we keep running against Rails test suite we'll, we can be fairly confident that um, things are in parity and if um, so it would of course be an optional thing that you can install just like fast blank but um, if your if your platform supports it and if you um, trust it enough it might give you some um, substantial performance gain and there are a lot of low hanging fruit for a smaller piece like um, for example the active support duration class like when you do one dot day that's the active support duration class that's created and um, so there are probably a lot of pieces um, small pieces like that that we can experiment with using Helix and eventually we can probably work on um, writing bigger pieces like perhaps the, the core routing library um, in Rust someday. So that's all great, but um, what about my app? Well, so while we're working on this project, we have a friend uh, who works at SESTI and they have a pretty interesting um, problem for us. So they, um, they for the most part, their the stack is a Ruby stack and um, they are, um, catering company in San Francisco that tries to um, um, deliver organized meals for, for companies based in the Bay Area. Um, and one of the problems that they have is they have a meal matching algorithm. So for example, um, there will be some constraints like I, um, some of my employees have these allergies so they cannot have meals with um, these items in it or sometimes um, there will be the opposite. Some of my employees prefer these features in the meals and you should make sure the meals have, um, have the, like uh, vegan or gluten free and et cetera. So at the end of the day, um, the problem boils down to something like this. You have um, some tags for, for each meal and you have some tags for um, different preferences um, your users might have and what you want to find out is whether the meal, the tags in the meal fully satisfy all the requirements in the, in the second array. Right, so this is the, the tags in the meal and what you want to see is if this first array fully contains um, all the numbers in the other array and that basically boils down to uh, uh, what we call set containment problem and there is a known trick for that. Oh, I should mention the reason they care is um, they have written this algorithm in Ruby and it's taking a long time to run, like sometimes like in measured in minutes, maybe up to 30 minutes, right? And they measured it and a lot of time is being spent in um, this um, set containment algorithm. So it would be interesting to see what you can do if you um, implement that algorithm in Rust. So. There's a known trick for setting, uh, testing set containment. If you um, go to Stack Overflow and look for it, you'll probably find a solution similar to this. Basically, um, to check whether an array fully contains another array, um, you can do an intersection between the two arrays, basically um, make a new array that only contains um, items that is in both of the original and the, the other array, right? And then you can check if that array is equal to um, the preferences array. So this would tell you whether your meal fully satisfied your preferences. So this is really nice to read, like all of the Ruby code that you're used to writing. Um, and usually it's fine, right? Like I think it's good to be able to start with something like this. Um, and um, so they have this in their code base and they have an existing test suite um, to test that this is working. So we uh, replicated that test suite and replicated this method and we confirmed that it indeed works as advertised. But we can do better than that um, because we, know, we happen to know that all of the numbers in the array is sorted and all of the numbers in the array are unique so there are no duplicates in the array. So after thinking really, really hard, we realized ah, we can do better. Um, so here is a different algorithm in pure Ruby to do the same thing. Um, 
I will walk through it quickly. So first of all, you check some edge cases. If either of the array is empty, um, then you can very quickly decide um, one way or the other without having to do a bunch of extra work. Um, then there's some boilerplate to checking, uh, tracking the position into like the index of the other array. And basically you loop through all the items on the longer array and uh, keep pointing to, um, keep a pointer into the other array and try to advance the pointer as you find um, similar item. If, and finally, if you get to the end of the loop, you know that you didn't, um, you, there are some items that is in the other array that's not in the original array. So um, it took us a while to figure this out, so if you don't immediately understand it, don't worry about it. Um, but the point is, we wrote this and we run it against the RSpec um, test we have, and it passes, and according to a benchmark, it's up to seven times faster. And um, the usual case is more, so it depends on the particular test case, right? Um, the usual case is more like two X, and but it goes all the way up to seven times. Um, so that's pretty great. You basically figure out the Google interview question you should give yourself a uh, pat on the back at this point. But what if we write that in Rust? So that's what we tried next. Um, again, we're using Helix, so um, we are using the declare types macro. We're reopening the array class, and um, we are defining the same fully contained method uh, with the type annotations. And here is the same code that checks for the edge cases and um, the same boilerplate for tracking the array index. Um, interestingly, here in Rust, um, as I mentioned earlier, if you use iterators, the compiler is actually able to do smarter things. So here, we're actually using an iterator instead of writing a hand-rolled loop. And because we're using an iterator, um, the loop body end up looking slightly better than the Ruby version, in my opinion. Um, but otherwise, it's the same, exactly the same algorithm. And finally, if you get to the bottom, you return false. And we benchmark this, and it runs up to 173 times faster than the Ruby version, depends on, depending on the workload. And I plotted this on a chart. You probably can't really see all the details, but each, um, basically, we ran a bunch of different um, test cases, and um, the blue line is the pure Ruby implementation that's the one-liner. The green lines are um, the fast algorithm written Ruby, and the yellow lines are the Rust implementation of the same algorithms. So you probably can't see a lot of blue and greens because they're mostly at the bottom, and um, I, I think the numbers are roughly, um, the Rust implementation is usually 10 to um, up to like 170 from, three times faster than the um, Ruby implementation. So that's pretty great. And um, here is, um, we are almost out of time, so rather quickly. So, um, so here is where you can find the code for the Helix project. It's a major work in progress, but we are on a pretty good track. And uh, if you would like to help us, um, you can come talk to us afterwards. And um, finally, I would like to close with, um, with this. Historically, um, scripting languages were slow and they're still relatively slow today. And because they're slow, um, they were mainly historically used as a coordination layer um, that delegates to heavier, heavier tools written in system languages like C. So for example, you might write your shell script in bash that delegates to Unix utilities like sort, grab, or work count um, to, do the ha to do the heavy lifting. Um, however, it turns out that a lot of the time we are actually doing IO bound operations like reading and writing to the hard drive or uh, waiting for network or talking to a database. Um, because IO operations are usually so much slower, the performance difference between a scripting language and a system language doesn't actually matter so much um, a lot of the time. But because scripting language is so much easier to write and so much more pleasant to use, uh, we end up moving a lot more of the code into the scripting layer uh, and instead of writing everything in C. So um, since web applications are so I.O. heavy, um, that worked out wonderfully for things like Rails and the fact that you can have 16 or 32 unicorn 
uh, process on like an eight core machine is probably a good, um, it's probably a good empirical evidence to say that that's true. Um, however, at the end of the day, um, we still have some, some occasional computationally heavy operations in our application. It turns out um, business logic is what defines your application and what set it apart from other apps. So I, I think we're entering a new era where we have taken a lot of the advancement from scripting languages, especially on the ergonomic side, and moved that into system languages like Rust. So uh, with Helix, you can readily move any computationally heavy part of your app back into Rust uh, without having to switch your entire stack to something like Go. And in my opinion, Rust is particularly suited for this task um, in Rails teams. Um, thanks to the safety guarantee offered by the Rust compiler, um, more of your team members will be able to tinker and experiment with the Rust code without worrying that it would cause problems at runtime. The worst you can do is not compile, um, make the program not compile, so like you probably try to get help at that point. Um, in our team, everyone end up picking up enough Rust to be able to fix bugs or make minor tweaks um, to our Rust agent in roughly half a year or so, and we think that will continue to be true. Uh, no pressure, Rocky. <laughs> Um, so our goal with the Helix project is to make this even more accessible to more Ruby teams um, so we can keep writing most of your code in the language you love without fearing that it will be too slow eventually. So because you can always drop down to Rust if and when you need to do that. So uh, once again, that's all I have today. And uh, you can find me on the internet as Champion Code. Thank you for your time. Let's make Ruby great again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.